Good afternoon. I'm Sister Esplan and will be your host for today's class. We welcome you from Provo, Utah. Today's class is offered to the general public by the BYU Family History Library. Our presenter is Liz Hutchison, who has a love of learning and an extensive background in family history and genealogical research. She is particularly fluent in French and has worked as a missionary at the BYU Family History Library and completed coursework at BYU. We hope you will find your time with us productive and enjoyable. I'll now turn the time over to Liz. Okay. Today, like we said, we're going to be going over Belgium genealogy. And we're going to first start with the basic resources that are available for if you are doing Belgium family history. And one of the most important ones is family search. In a later video, I will go over exactly how to access these. But we have Family Search, a really good site for Belgian records. It's free as long as you create an account. And you can see lots of parish records, a lot of the civil records in it. So what you'll do is you'll go through images, records. And one thing I suggest is communities. If you ever come through something where, you know, you don't know what a document says, or if you have a question, there's usually people on there that are just dedicated to answering everything. So they have a Belgium and Netherlands group. The next resource right here is State Archives of Belgium. The State Archives of Belgium is a website located at arch.be. You also have to have an account, but it's free. Uh, it presents itself mainly in Dutch, so you might have to put translate to Google. But what's great about this is every single parish record that they have found, they have been really dedicated to posting that online. There's also other types of sources that you might not find on family search, such as grain census records. So I would suggest looking at that if you can't find any records in, in family search. The next resource is Jenny in it. Now, Genianet is kind of like Ancestry, but it's for French people and, you know, just anyone that has family from over there uh, in that region. Genianet is a really good resource, but you've got to be really careful with it as well. There tends to be a lot of people copying trees from each other. And so sometimes just because it says, you know, just because someone says that this is what the family tree is, doesn't always mean that that's actually the truth. So what I would suggest for Jenny in it is to use it for hints and sources. A lot of times it will list an ancestor's birth date and it will say where it's at. And you can use that information to look up the actual original record and make sure that what's listed there is correct. The next source is napoleon.org. Uh, there's something that we will be running into, and it's called the French Republican Calendar. And that's where they change the calendaring system. They as in the French Republic. And it's very confusing, and you have to convert the dates when you come across that. There's lots of resources online. There's also things you can download if you prefer a hard copy of it. But one of the websites that I use that I prefer is napoleon.org. And we will be going over that in a few weeks. So the next source is, of course, Google and Wikipedia. I use this a lot, especially when I'm trying to figure out the general history of a certain area. It can be pretty hard to know what this place was throughout history. In Belgium, in particular, you have places that were conquered by different kingdoms. And so they kind of, you know, it's harder to tell the whole history and what this used to be named. And that's where Google's really helpful in that case. Next resource is, of course, the BYU Family History website. There's live help you can access. There's experts there, videos and guides. For example, I'm going to be going a little more over on the French side of Belgium. I haven't really looked into the Dutch, but there are webinars that are on the archive for Dutch areas. So I would suggest looking at that if you get stuck on anything. 
Also, lastly, I have my email address right here. If you need any help with any French translation, uh, you can go ahead and email me there, and I would love to help. Well, let's move on to the geography. It's really important to understand the geography of Belgium because Belgium is very uh, sandwiched right here, as you can see on the map, between France and Germany. Belgium has a rich history, even though it was only established as its own country in 1830. It has a very rich history that's linked with the territories that surround it. For example, you have France in the southern area, and then you have the Netherlands up there in the north. And a lot of times this part of Belgium tends to have more influence from Netherlands. And then the part that's closest to France has more influence from France. Also, you can see that Germany's right there to the east, and you will find certain areas that actually have German speaking. You'll notice that there's also the English Channel and how it runs really close to Belgium, and that's actually gonna come into use in a few minutes, I'll, I'll show you. So, Belgium has been known throughout history as the crossroads and the battlegrounds of Europe. It started with the Crusades that happened many years ago. And what's so important about this is with the Crusades, you had expansion of territory, you had exploration of different lands and new tastes. So you started to see kind of a trading system be established. Then the history of Belgium was very affected by the age of exploration. Think uh, Christopher Columbus, Magellan and all of these people who took to the sea to discover the new world. That helped further the taste and uh, new tastes in certain products that are foreign, exploration of certain territories. Well, then we get to Antwerp. Antwerp is located in a really key spot for Belgium back then. It's actually got access to the sea directly. And so it became, you know, in the 1500s, the economic capital of all of Europe. There's access to sea, and it's also kind of located right in the middle of those kingdoms. And so this is where you get merchants from everywhere. That's where the crossroads part comes in. Now, of course, if you have valuable land like Antwerp, you're going to have a lot of eyes drawn to it and wanting to conquer it. And the result of the economic wealth of Antwerp meant that a lot of those kingdoms around it ended up fighting over it. And that's something that I actually want to show on a YouTube video that I have because it really helps to understand why you might run into difficulties with Belgium genealogy. So this starts in 1500. And as you can see, we have the Holy Roman Empire in France. This main area is Belgium. And all I wanna do is just kind of show just from the 1500s going on until 1830, how many times this changes color? Cause that shows how many times it changed territories, kingdoms, and who controlled Belgium. So if you'll just watch this area as it's going forward. You can see how many times it switches back and forth. We're now getting closer to when Napoleon will take over and you will see all of France bloom as he conquered territory. And then it goes right back away when he is taken over. And there is Belgium right there. So it wasn't until 1830 that Belgium actually was established as its own kingdom, but there's lots of territories around it that would fight over it. So don't be surprised if in one year, it's called 
in this location and then in the next year it's in the next. So this is very important for genealogy because with the invasions, you have a change in rule. You have change in borders, jurisdictions, the languages. You'll have Dutch some years, some years French. And the record keeping can be a little bit confusing when you're trying to go back in time and link your family together. Wait, my family's from this area, but suddenly it's in a different district. So you just have to be flexible with that and realize. Another thing, battles caused a lot of loss of lives, of course, but also of the records. There were many records that were lost or destroyed during certain battles. Other records were postponed because they couldn't get there and actually declare it. So you'll see a lot of retroactive types of records. See, especially in like the 1800s, you'll see a lot of people that have to go back and declare their birth because it was never actually recorded due to there being so much trouble in the area. Also, constant changes make it very difficult for the declarants themselves to report the dates and places. This is something I come across a lot. You'll have someone who is declaring the death of their father, and you can almost see it in the writing that they're not quite sure where their father died because it was this area, but what was it called back then? So you'll have a lot of confusion there. But the lucky thing is nowadays it's a lot easier to tell how Belgium's organized. So this isn't throughout all of history as you could see how many times it changed. But we have right now, this is kind of how Belgium presents itself. We have regions, région, and then there's a Dutch word. The next division is provinces. Then we have arrondissements, which are kind of like districts. And lastly, communes, and those are more like your cities. So as you can see, you have three regions in Belgium, and they are indicated in this picture. You have the Flemish region, which is up to the north. If you remember right, that's where the Netherlands were. So it makes sense that this region is mostly Dutch speaking nowadays. Then to the south, which is touching the border of France, we have the Walloon region, and they're more Francophone. There's also the Brussels capital region, which is organized a little differently than everything else, but it is bilingual for the most part. There are five provinces in each of these regions, but Brussels kind of has a different way of organizing as was previously stated. So there's five West Flanders, East Flanders, Antwerpen, that's where Antwerp is, Flemish Brabant, and Limburg. And then you can see right here that Hainaut, Namur, Luxembourg, Liège, Brabant, Walloon. These are all the French regions, so it's pretty easy. Provinces stay pretty close. Next, we have arrondissements. There's too many to really count, but these change the most. You'll have certain sections, for example, that are in the arrondissement of Charleroi one year, and then the next year it's in uh, Mont or another place. Lastly, total, there are 581 communes. These are cities, towns, municipalities. They're kind of the smallest division point. These are very important. And these stay pretty concrete as far as their name. So now we're on to history and main sources. What I'm going to do is only talk about things in Belgium history that directly affect the genealogical records that you are most likely going to come across. There's alternative sources that on the fifth class, we'll go over those because there's some really interesting ones. So. In Belgium, you have pretty easy your church records and then you have your civil registration. That's pretty standard for most of Europe. Church records are going to be before 1795. They're mostly Catholic because this is the Holy Roman Empire. It's the Catholic Church. So they're going to be doing things in Latin. 
And the main sources are baptisms, marriages, and deaths. You will occasionally come across a few in French and Dutch, but those are probably in the later years, I would say. One thing you will run into with church records is it was a very strong tradition to have your child named after a certain saint. The problem is, is there's only so many saints. So you will find, especially before 1795, that almost everyone in Belgium is a variation of John or Mary. So you'll have Jean-Jacques, you'll have Marie-Joseph, and all of those things. It can be pretty hard to actually distinguish families. Civil registrations are going to be the main source that you're going to use after 1795. You have your birth, marriages, and death records. Notarial acts have very good genealogical worth, but they aren't all available at the moment. And the Belgium archive, the state archives, are actually working on digitizing that. These are in French and Dutch for the most part. And these are the main parts of history that affect the records that I will be talking about. You have 1795 to 1804, which was the first French Republic. And then from 1804 to 1815, the rise and fall of Napoleon. And that really changed how records were kept throughout all of Europe. So starting with the first French Republic, what happened in 1794 is you have France going through the French Revolution. This was during the years of terror where everyone was getting their heads chopped off. And as the French Revolution started to overthrow these, uh, it's called the Ancien Regime, and that means the old way of doing things, which would be monarchy and then the church. Anyways, as they started to overthrow that, they were able to fight against their longtime enemies, the Austrian or Habsburgs. These French campaigns ended up moving all Dutch away from Belgium area, and now they're over French. Now, the Belgium at first weren't too concerned because a lot of them did speak French. They were familiar with the culture. But as France gained power, they started to do something that really challenged the core of what Belgium was all about. So first, this Dutch language was slowly abolished during this time. At first, it started that all documents were recorded, had to be recorded in French, which doesn't affect the people that much. But then it got to the point where we speak French because this is part of the French Republic. That wasn't too popular with some of these areas that had dialects of Dutch or didn't know any French at all. The next thing is a Catholic church was suppressed. Since that was the Ancien Regime, you have a lot of work on trying to make sure that there's no influence of the church over the public. So, one thing is religious icons were actually confiscated. For example, you can see right here in this cool picture, it says the religion of our fathers and mothers, come see. They would actually get rid of crosses because that invaded the public sphere. They would get rid of bells and allow them not to ring in public because that invaded the public sphere and oppressed the people. So they kind of went a little crazy with that. And, you know, one of the things that happened as a result of that is you had a lot of churches that were plundered and a lot of records that were lost, unfortunately. Next, mandatory military service. This is very important. It was required of every Belgian man to serve in the French army. The way that they enforced this was when the man was going to get married, they had to actually provide proof that they had served in the military. The result, I can't say for certain that this is the truth, but from what I've seen in the patterns, there's a certain time period where there's a lot more illegitimate births because the men have to prove that they served in the French army. 
And there were times that they didn't really want to do that. Lastly, you have civil registers, church records, no longer were acceptable. And instead, they started to institute civil registers and standardize the acts across the whole area. This was actually a really good thing because from parish to parish and priest to priest, your records present way differently prior to 1795. But after that time period, the civil records are really easier. They're easier to read. They have consistent information. Now, the next part is the French Republican calendar. The French Republic took place from the 22nd of September, 1792 to the 1st of January, 1805. That ancien regime I was talking about, it's dead. And the French were very passionate about this back in the day. They thought, we've killed the old Republic. We have a new perfect Republic and everything that has to do with that old Republic, which is royalty and church, we need to cut that off. So they decided that they needed to change the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar has lots of Christian symbols in it. They have August, the month August. The royalty kind of had roles over that. You have certain days that are holidays and every day was named after a saint. So anyways, they decided they needed a different calendar, which can be quite the headache for a genealogist. So they got together a whole group of people, and I mean biologists, chemists, they got a mathematician, astrologist, and they got even a playwright to come together and come up with a new calendar that was based on science and nature and had nothing to do with the Ancien Regime. So... They decided that the new year would start on the autumn equinox. That means the beginning of the year is in September. They have years 1 through 14, so no longer were they going to be known as year 1798. It was now year 1 or 2 of the French Republic. They had new months based on every season, and each of these months had 30 days. You can see right here, there's a pretty little lady, and she is known as Brumaire or the frosty and cold month, the foggy month. That's October. So they pushed this quite a bit. Now, with 30 days in 12 different months, we still have five or six days that are left that need to be covered. So at the very end of the year, which would be before September 22nd-ish, they would have these jour complémentaires, which were just complimentary extra days, kind of like leap day. Next, they named every single day after flowers and trees and got rid of them being after saints. One other problem is you're going to run into long-winded and very flowery language. I mean, it's a big difference. They go into way too much detail about the things that don't matter. And it can be a little hard to look at these records and want to dive in and translate them because they just present so differently. But when you come across this, and we will be going over this in a future webinar, Napoleon.org is the resource that I use. I briefly talked about that. As you can see, you can convert the calendar system this says the fourth of the month of Frimer, year 10 of the French Republic. You put that in and it gives you the equivalent Gregorian date. The next important thing is the rise and fall of Napoleon. So this is where things get interesting. In 1804, Napoleon crowns himself emperor. And in 1806, to the relief of many of the genealogists, he banished the Republican calendar and went back to the Gregorian. So that's only a few years you have to figure that stuff out. Now, there is a problem with this. Officials in different areas would sometimes take it upon themselves to convert the dates. And a lot of times they got it right. But if they were recording for like, let's say a couple were getting married and they wanted to record when each one was born, but it was in the Republican calendar, sometimes they didn't always convert it correctly. So you might come across that. Also, 
family members themselves were unsure of the birth and ages because that whole system completely changed and then it was brought back. Between 1803 and 1815, what really affects the records are coalitions. This is when Napoleon was conquering the world and trying to take it over. And you saw on that map before where everything just ballooned out and became blue. And then as soon as he was defeated, it all shrunk back. What's important about this is you have expansion of French territory. Even Germany had to do their records in French. But Belgium men oftentimes died far away from home. Because they were forced to be in the military, a lot of them died way far away and ended up not either not being recorded or there was a delay in recording their death. But the good news is there was standardized and mandatory record keeping. Napoleon at least did that right. And so you'll see about, you know, 1800s, you'll see all of Europe really benefit and have better record keeping. Next, we have the defeat at Waterloo. When Napoleon was defeated, the Netherlands or the Dutch, kind of that old Austrian Habsburg rule, they decided to come and battle back for Belgium. And eventually Dutch returned to those areas. So as far as the language goes, that's the biggest change. Okay, so in conclusion, this is just your main stuff. Records, before 1795, you're going to want to look through parish and church records. If the date you're looking for is after 1795, you're going to want to look through the civil registration. But if it's between about 1795 and 1805, be aware that you're going to have to convert those dates and read these long winded acts. As far as the language goes, it really helps if you familiarize yourself with, uh, on family search, there's genealogical word lists. So if you familiarize yourself with Latin, French, and Dutch, just getting those basic things, you can read the records just like a pro. Now, the last thing is there's going to be inconsistencies. And I mentioned a lot of that throughout this presentation. Genealogy isn't perfect. You're going to come across mistakes. The other day I came across a mistake where they put the mother-in-law of a bride as her mother. I don't know if the person that was keeping the records just got really confused because the names were similar. But you'll come across things like this and you have to kind of allow that to happen and realize that you're going to come across incorrect info, but it doesn't mean that's not the person you're looking for. And then this is actually a little out of date, but this is kind of an outline of the classes just here is reading Belgium church records, which should be posted, reading Belgium civil registers will actually take place on the 2nd. Reading French Republic records, we're going to spend a whole entire time doing that. And then lastly, if you have any questions or thoughts or things you would like to go over, feel free to email. And I just want to thank you so much.